I'm Linda Cheryl Green, Dean of the Michigan State College of Law, where our graduates are transforming lives and serve in Michigan's and the world's diverse communities. Welcome to tonight's installment of the Michigan State University College of Law Faculty Speaker Series. Our topic tonight is Making Sense of Immigration Policy, Past, Present, and Future. And our speakers are Professor Veronica Thronson and Professor David Thronson. They direct the MSU College of Law Immigration Clinic. Let me introduce my colleagues. Veronica Thronson is a clinical professor of law and director of the Immigration Law Clinic at MSU Law and also overall director of our law clinics. Her BA and JD are from the City University of New York. She was directing attorney of the Domestic Violence Project at the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada. And later, she was director of training and legal services for the 200 member New York Immigration Coalition. She advocates for immigrants and survivors of domestic violence. She also trains attorneys and judges in immigration law. MSU has recognized her as an outstanding teacher and in 2020, the Michigan chapter of the American Immigration Lawyers Association honored her with its pro bono champion award. David Thronson is the Alan S. Zeckelman Professor of International Human Rights Law and Director of the Talsky Center for Human Rights of Women and Children. After degrees from Kansas, Columbia University, and Harvard Law, he taught in Nepal as a member of the Peace Corps and also taught in the New York City Public Schools. His scholarship focuses on family law and immigration law. He is the co-author of a leading immigration law casebook and has received many accolades. In fact, this month, the American Immigration Lawyers Association honored him. We are so fortunate to have these two professors to discuss our topic because immigration law is important in legal practice and in public policy discourse. Many areas of law have immigration dimensions, those who practice family law, criminal law, tax law, education law, and employment law will regularly find immigration intersections in their work. Of course, the practice of law is important, but we are also preparing our graduates to lead their communities. We want our graduates to be familiar with immigration law because immigration issues affect all sectors of society and every area of public policy. An understanding of this subject matter is necessary preparation for the many leadership roles our graduates will undertake. As a result of the Thronsons, MSU Law is nationally recognized for the strength of its work on this subject, for its influential scholarship, as well as for the opportunities that our students have to study and practice immigration law. Professors David Thronson and Professor Veronica Thronson founded the Immigration Law Clinic in 2010. The clinic is a law firm staffed by our professors and students that provides free legal representation to clients from 86 countries. They take on challenging cases, representing clients who are often children who are not eligible for legal aid representation and clients who cannot afford to hire an attorney. The Immigration Law Clinic has provided free legal representation to clients from 86 countries and its faculty and students have secured lawful permanent resident status for almost 300 clients. These clients include survivors of human trafficking and domestic abuse, people seeking asylum as a result of persecution for their religious or political beliefs, for their gender identity or their sexual orientation. Some are victims of war crimes, and some are children who have traveled to the United States alone. Our students have appeared in over 200 US Citizenship and Immigration Services hearings, in almost 400 immigration court hearings, and in over 200 probate and family court hearings. Over the past decade, the clinic has developed a national reputation for excellence. 
This explains why our graduates who have served in the Immigration Law Clinic are in high demand. They have won prestigious fellowships and other significant employment placements. The clinic also selects outstanding law graduates to serve as teaching fellows. These law graduates want to, want to lead their own law school immigration clinics, and they come to MSU Law to learn how. The fellows have gone on to lead clinics at the University of Arkansas, the University of Illinois, Louisiana State University, and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. They are also practicing immigration law, transforming lives and creating the opportunity that is at the heart of the American dream. David and Veronica, since 2010, you have had an extraordinary effect on immigration law, both locally and nationally. Thank you for your service and thank you for your time tonight. We look forward to your remarks. And a welcome everyone who is part of this webinar. Uh, from the list we were given, we know that there are a lot of our former students. And uh, as former students or immigration practice uh, practitioners, you know that immigration law is a mess, right? I think that's one of the things we can definitely agree on, that it is a mess, it is complicated, and very, very difficult to understand. It is difficult to understand as professors and practitioners, let alone people who have to go through the process. And so uh, tonight, David and I thought that we would, I don't think we're going to be able to make sense of, uh, of immigration, the complexity of immigration law, but we thought that we'll have David give you a little bit of background in uh, showing you how is it that we got to where we are right now. Then I'll take it over and talk more a little bit about the practical experience of, uh, of the law and also the changes, the recent changes in asylum law and the cases the clinic has taken. Then we'll get back to, uh, to David to talk about the uh, border and what is happening with uh, family separation and children being sent uh, back to, uh, to their country of origin. And then we'll end up with, uh, with questions. And hopefully, we only have an hour, so we are going to try to be um, you know, a little bit more concise. And, um, and one of the things too is that we won't expect you to, um, to have knowledge of immigration law, right? Like many uh, of you who uh, have taken David's class know that it's pretty complex and uh, you immediately forget it after the exam. So, uh, so we're not going to be quizzing you on immigration law, but we definitely want to have this conversation to make sure that when you are out in the public, right, and you are uh, listening to people saying horrible things about what's going on or how everybody is getting um, asylum or how everybody is coming to uh, steal jobs, but then they are on uh, relying on public assistance because immigrants are lazy, right? So which one is it? And so we definitely want to make sure that we spend some time talking about it, because if you think about it, uh, immigration law hasn't really changed since the INA back in uh, 1952, and yet it keeps changing, right? And it's constantly in the news, and there is a lot of misinformation out there. And so the idea tonight is to make sure that we make sense and uh, of what's going on, and also show you how is it that this uh, section of the law changes, and yet it hasn't really changed uh, since the early 50s. So I'm going to leave it there and, uh, and give it to David. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, you know, as Veronica said, our Immigration and Nationality Act has been in place since 1952, and we've tweaked, we made a, a few uh, major changes to tighten it up in 1996, but basically it's in place. It's the same law that we've been living with, yet we have these wild swings in immigration law. And, and want to think a little bit about why that's in, in place. But, but first, why is it so hard to just fix the law? You know, why are we stuck with, with an INA, an Immigration and Nationality Act that nobody likes um, and, and nobody does? On either side, any angle you come at it, 
The Immigration and Nationality Act is a poorly written statute. It's inconsistent. It doesn't work. So, so how did we get here? Um, and one answer to that is that immigration law is a lens through which we see every major societal issue come to play. Um, anything, any public debate that's going on has an element of it that plays out in our immigration debate. And we haven't been able to resolve them in other contexts. We shouldn't really expect that we're gonna resolve them in, in immigration law. So, so let's take a few examples here. Um, race, we are finally, hopefully, in some ways, having a, a national conversation about um, the importance of race in, in our society and how longstanding um, systemic uh, issues need to be resolved, need to be addressed, need to be talked about and, and taken on. Well, you know, immigration law uh, of all places started in a, in a very dark place. The, one of the very first laws that was passed in this country was a naturalization law, which was restricted to um, free white men um, to, to go through, free white persons actually. Uh, so, so, you know, we started with a race-based law in immigration. Um, when we finally got around 100 years later to doing federal laws for immigration, we started with Chinese exclusion laws, which based on race, took an entire group of people and said, you're not welcome in the United States, you're, you're to be excluded. Um, we are more subtle than that today, but it's not gone. Um, race is, is inherent, it's baked in to immigration law. Um, those of you who've looked at it know that there are facially neutral provisions in immigration law that have impact only on people coming from Mexico and Central America. And they are essentially country-based and race-based. Um, we have a diversity visa lottery, which was very popular when it was proposed and it was you know, laughingly referred to as the Irish sweepstakes and it was going to be the tool which would increase European immigration. Um, now, 30 years later, 40 years later, when it turns out that this is a law that's utilized by a lot of people from Africa, all of a sudden it's a very unpopular law and, and always on the chopping block every time we talk about reform. So there are ways in which race and barriers to race, barriers to integrating into society are, are there, um, always have been, still are, and, and we need to call them out. We need to think about them as we're going forward, but they're hard for people to talk about. They're a tough thing for people to go with reform. The economy, money. Um, what do we do with immigrants who are coming to work in the United States? And many people want to come and work in the United States and we need them to come and work. Um, in the pandemic of people who were listed as essential workers in the United States, a full 20% of them were immigrants. Um, millions of people who are undocumented were simultaneously listed as essential workers in really important segments of our society. We need immigrant workers. And we've often you know, said in the, in the words of a, a German sociologist, we wanted labor and we got people. Um, and that's been, attention and a problem. When can we have someone come and work and offer their services to the United States for pay, but then ship them off at the end of the day and say, go away, go back. And when do they get to be part of our society? When do they get to say, oh, I'm working and contributing. This is a place where I can raise my children. These public schools that I'm supporting are places that can educate my children as opposed to me going back and being separated from my family um, while I'm working here and sending money back to other people. This has been a tension that, that we've had for a long time and it's something people fight about. It's not an easy thing for people to resolve. Family is an important issue in immigration law, but that begs the question, whose family? What about same-sex couples? What about extended family? Who gets to say what family is important? And immigration law has some very precise ideas about who is family, what types of families we value, and what types of families we reject. And those are fighting points where people um, have difficulty reaching agreement and working through. Um, we have humanitarian impulses worked in at the core of our Immigration and Nationality Act. We've signed on to, ratified, adopted um, humanitarian conventions, the Convention Against Torture, um, the 
67 Protocol to the Refugee Convention of 1951, which make national commitments to what we're going to do on the humanitarian front in terms of refugees coming to the United States. Yet we also then have great fears about um, floodgates. What would happen? Um, we are not a great refugee receiving country in this world. Um, there are a million refugees from Syria in Lebanon right now, tiny Lebanon. Um, we are debating whether or not we can take in 30,000 or 60,000 refugees in a year um, into our country, which is you know, vastly larger as we think about this. So um, we're concerned about the tens of thousands of people at our border looking to get in. And we'll come back and talk about uh, the border later. Um, and finally, we have some fundamental disagreements about um, what the rule of law should look like. Um, we see people bringing forward and, and pushing a focus on anyone who has violated immigration law should not at any point be able to regularize their status, receive immigration benefits. Um, but we also see there's another side to immigration law where um, often our systems aren't fair. Um, they don't provide avenues. There is no line to get in for many people. Um, and sometimes those lines are artificially delayed and slowed as we um, don't process people through um, benefits for which they're eligible. And we delay their eligibility for years in ways that force family separation to be extended in many instances as we go. So we have a, a long um, and, and convoluted history as to when and how we enforce the, the immigration laws. And, and clearly we don't have um, all the resources we would need to um, strictly enforce our immigration laws. And after decades of um, inviting people in for certain purposes to work and um, taking advantage of that, they built up equities in the United States that, that are then hard to walk away from. And they have families and connections in ways that our immigration law doesn't address and can't take on as we go there. So um, we end up with these strong positions that people stake out. They're great political fodder. Um, in our increasingly gerrymandered districts, these are things that are red meat for um, people on all you know, parts of the spectrum of immigration law. They dig in. It's hard to find compromise. Um, what little immigration uh, legislation we've been able to get through tends to be things that are snuck in, cobbled together, um, bargains, trade-offs, things that are done in the middle of the night without hearings and attached to a must-pass appropriations bill, and it sneaks through. And then lo and behold, it turns out, you know, a little bit of hearing and vetting would have been good because that completely contradicts something else that's in the law. Now we've created um, language that, that can be read either way. And what we've set up then here is a law that has lots very little prospect of changing the law, um, but lots of leeway, lots of play in the joints, lots of discretion as Congress isn't changing it for the executive to act, to say, I'm going to interpret it this way. I'm going to emphasize these things and an next administration can come in and, and do other things. In that our courts have very much stepped back. Um, even though we hear lots about immigration cases in the courts, one of the things to keep in mind is the courts defer to the executive, to Congress and immigration more than anywhere else. The immigration laws get away with things that would not fly anywhere else. Gender distinctions, distinctions um, th that have really invidious um, impacts on different groups of people are perfectly ratified in immigration law. The courts let them go. And as those things happen, we're left with this mess. We, we have this ongoing debate. Now, over time, we've seen most administrations say, I recognize all of this play in the joints. Um, and we see back and forth constantly within uh, the practice of immigration law, within the emphasis that, that an administration would put on immigration law. Um, but most administrations have chosen not to go to extremes because they realize you know, future administration, future executive can come in and, and simply roll that back. And they've, they've hewed somewhat to the middle of the line. They've let the bureaucracy 
run things. Um, we have an, a vast, vast immigration bureaucracy of, of adjudicators, um, both um, in the immigration courts and, and through USCIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, adjudicating benefits in immigration law, the enforcement provisions in ICE, they've largely let this go um, and, and let the bureaucracy be somewhat of a, a lodestar in, in how this goes. Um, our, our last administration it didn't do that. Um, they said, we'll look at some of the play in the joints in immigration law, and we're going to push the most extreme versions of this. And as it turns out, in many cases, exceeded the most extreme versions that, that even uh, a lax Immigration and Nationality Act um, would permit as, as they pushed and, and went through this. And so um, we feel the snap back of things um, happening as we get more. Right now, we're feeling this in a more pronounced way because our last administration pushed further from a center. Um, uh, and we're seeing a, a, a sense of moving back, you know, not really past where we were. In some ways, we, we still are much more restrictionist in immigration um, laws and, and what's happening now than we were, um, you know, prior to the last administration. But um, we have this seesaw effect as we're going back. And, you know, that makes it a hard area to practice. It makes it a hard area for, for immigrants who are trying to come to the United States. And so I'm, I'm going to turn it back over to Veronica, who's going to um, talk about one area, um, just to, to pick them out. Um, immigration law, as we said, is vast, and there's so many things going on. But, you know, one area where in particular, the, the clinic's been very active in the last couple of years, and talk about uh, what that practice has looked like, and, and where we are with this um, seesaw. So, Veronica, back to you. Thank you. And one of the things that um, I'm sure most of you know, but I but I want to emphasize is the fact that the changes we see in immigration law are not limited to one particular party, a uh, political party. And so most of you may be too young to remember, but uh, President Clinton back in 96 signed uh, one of the most anti-immigrant uh, laws that uh, exist. And, and we are still three, the three uh, different, you see he's always interrupting, but anyway, I'll, I'll let you go with that one. Um, and so it's very difficult, right, to, to assume, oh, this past administration did that or did this or did the other. You know, President Obama deported more immigrants than any other president before him. He didn't care about uh, deporting parents of US citizen uh, uh, children, deporting children, right? And we continue to do. I mean, uh, President Biden has, has deported a lot of children as well. So it's not, uh, it's not limited to a, a political party, right? And the reason why this is easy to do is because we don't have legislation. And so there is room for shifting, right? And so every administration that comes, because we don't have uh, legislation, then they are able to make changes that are going to affect uh, uh, the lives of so many people. But of course, most administrations have been a little bit restrained, right? Like they have said, okay, we'll go after the immigrants who have a, a criminal record, for example, right? Or people who don't have any relief. But then when the uh, Trump administration took, uh, took over, they started taking advantage and definitely using the executive power to implement uh, different changes that completely changed, right? And made it even more difficult, even though it has always been difficult to, uh, to practice immigration law. And one of these things, right, like with, uh, with Attorney General Sessions, who started referring cases to, uh, to himself, reversing uh, so many laws that were on the books that were they weren't as, as generous as we, as we would have liked them to be. But at least there was a sense that the immigration system was fair and that you would be getting a chance to uh, plead your case and then uh, get a fair decision. You may remember he called the immigration attorneys dirty attorneys, right? And uh, President Trump said that asylum was a scam. 
that the dirty attorneys were, uh, you know, uh, advising people to lie and to uh, say that they had a fear to, uh, to return back home so they could be allowed in. And if it was easy, right? If, and, and for some of you who are practitioners, if it was easy, everybody would have papers, right? I mean, even looking at, at the numbers in Detroit, we have uh, like an 85% denial rate in asylum uh, from the four judges, uh, one judge more in particular who has a, um, a grant rate of 15.2 or something like that in, in Detroit alone, right? And so the judges are also having a lot of pressure. And uh, when Biden took office uh, a few days later in February, he uh, directed the Attorney General and DHS to uh, implement legislation to start thinking, how are we going to be changing uh, the asylum laws to make them fair? And advocates were pushing, right? They were saying, okay, something has to happen. Legislation takes a very, very long time to go through the process. And so what can you do? And so uh, just yesterday, uh, the attorney general uh, vacated these decisions that had prevented victims of domestic violence who were fleeing abuse from uh, qualifying for asylum. And also uh, vacated this other uh, case that prevented people from uh, making a, cl a claim uh, as a nuclear family uh, for uh, a particular social group. And so, as David said, at the clinic, we had been litigating these cases and, uh, you know, we had been successful, uh, mostly because some of you who had been in the clinic before know how much it, it takes, right, to get a case ready and to spend hours and hours uh, getting a case ready, getting the clients ready. And, uh, and we definitely try to our best because most times, uh, if people didn't have the students who are working at the clinic, they would go unrepresented. And so, as you know, uh, we do not provide an attorney to people who are um, fighting their deportation and immigration court. And so that is very, very difficult. It's so difficult to, uh, to litigate a case, even with an attorney present, right? Because the, the law is so complicated. And so it's very difficult. Uh, people think that it is easy to, um, to, to get relief and it takes years. And then we're having this huge backlog of cases. Uh, I have a case that has been scheduled for December of 2023. And uh, we have cases, right, people who uh, we have filed for U visas who have been pending for years and years. And so it is a very slow process and it is a frustrating process. And uh, hopefully with this administration, we are going to start seeing some change. It is hard. It is hard because Congress is divided. And uh, one of the issues we see is that advocates want comprehensive immigration reform. And then people are fighting over their, their groups, right? Some people want, you know, let's, let's get the dreamers something or let's get parents of US citizens something, right? And so everybody, so there is this tension that everybody is advocating for their own groups and then nothing gets done. And so um, it is difficult to understand uh, all these uh, thousands of people who are still pending, right? Uh, people who are waiting at the border to see what will happen. People who continue to be separated from their uh, children, people who are detained, right? And so it's very, very hard. Uh, now we are seeing a little bit of, uh, of change. We are seeing now that uh, ICE has been told that they need to exercise their uh, discretion to see if they could close some cases or at least agree to, uh, to continue in cases as well, because that's, that's also um, something that you see with, you know, in, in regular criminal law practice with prosecutors have the discretion to, to whether to charge and bring a case. And, and so in immigration, we don't have that. And so at least we are seeing some positive change, but it is going to take a while. So I'm going to uh, turn it to David to cover a little bit of uh, what's going on at the border. 
Yeah, and I, I'm going to be really brief because we'd like to have time to take some questions and, and think about you. But, you know, thinking about how all these things tie together and, and how they work, we think, you know, these decisions that uh, just, did, you know, yesterday were, were vacated um, had a tremendous impact. They, they impacted people who had pending cases before the immigration courts. They took their cases and, and very significantly narrowed their eligibility. But that's just really the tip of the iceberg in terms of what they did. Because what happened was that ethic got transferred to the border. And so when people showed up and said, I want to apply for asylum, and they are supposed to be screened for a credible fear and have a credible fear interview, that interview was then done through the lens of, of an artificially restricted case law. And people will tell, oh, well, you don't have an asylum claim. You get turned away and they get turned back. Um, even people who had, uh, claims that, that were valid, that could go forward into our system. And our law permits people to present themselves in the United States or at the border and, and uh, apply for asylum uh, expressly in the law to do this. Um, we said, well, you know, we're kind of busy here at the border. We're, only, we're going to do metering. We're only going to let a few of you apply every day. Everyone else wait. And then we took people who were already in the United States who applied for asylum and said, we're going to send you back to Mexico and we're going to have you go to Mexico and we'll call you when, when we're ready to hear your claim. So in the meantime, you're over there, uh, often referred to as the Remain in, in Mexico program and in sort of an Orwellian type title, the, the administration called that the um, Migration Protection Protocol. So we're gonna protect you by sending you back to a place where um, there are no protections um, for this. We made agreements with third countries, El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala to take asylum seekers and to say to people, um, when they came to the United States, well, thank you for applying for asylum here, but we're going to let you go apply for asylum in El Salvador instead under this agreement. We'll send you there and maybe they'll give you asylum um, as we go. So we had these agreements in place. Now, all of these have been ra rather rapidly phased out, either stopped by the courts as we were going, and there were some other restrictions on, on applying at the border. Um, but the granddaddy of them all was our COVID. Um, reaction to say under Title 42, under not immigration law, but health laws, we can exclude people. Now, we made all kinds of exceptions for this. We said, oh, the people we want to come in, we're not going to exclude them based on health. Um, people coming for business, people coming for trade, that's fine. We'll let that go. But all these asylum seekers, everyone else, we're going to keep them out. And we even extended that to children. Um, our law, the Trafficking Victims Protection and Reauthorization Act of 2008, expressly says in statute um, that children are not to be turned back at the border, that they're going to be processed to see if they have valid immigration um, claims, that they can only be returned to another country if we can guarantee safe repatriation. And yet we use an excuse um, under Title 42 to simply turn kids back. Um, part of what we've seen at the border, part of the the rush of people in the border um, is not a big rush from other countries, but a pent up group that's been at the border for months, for, for years in some cases, um, waiting for an opportunity to have their asylum claims heard, waiting for them to be, be heard um, in a way that's fair. Um, the Biden administration has stopped using this Title 42 CDC order as a way to turn back children. Um, but we're still using it to turn back adults at the border. So we're still in a place where we're turning back more people um, right now at the border than, than you know, previous administrations have done. Um, we've already turned back more people this year than we're turned back all of last year um, at the border. And, and there are ways in which this is you know, undermining our sense of, of a rule of law as well as we get there. So um, what do we take away from, from all of this? Um, you know, this is just the, the tiniest little slice, this humanitarian um, piece of, of immigration law. Um, we haven't talked about business immigration. We haven't talked about um, family immigration and all the changes and everything that's happening there. Um, immigration law, just as Dean Green said at the beginning, permeates everywhere in, in our society, all forms of law. It's something that, that we all need to be um, thinking about and, and working through. Um, so um, happy to take your questions. We, we haven't made total sense of immigration law, I guarantee you, um, not even for ourselves, but, but tried to explain a little bit about uh, the nature of the mess we're in um, to, to get there. And um, 
you know, and I'll just say we'll we'll have a chance to, to talk earlier, but but it's really great to see um, some of these um, names and, and folks from the past coming back in. Um, I just want to say one thing before we we turn it over to to Dean Green. Um, you know, the clinic experience and and really the, for the last you know several years, the the clinic is Veronica's um, turf and baby, and and she's done you know amazing things with the, with the clinic. And and you know those of you who are were students there know this. Um, some of the you know names I see are people who I know are out there practicing immigration law, but but others of you I know aren't practicing immigration law. Um, you know, and part of what we love about the immigration clinic, it is just a great training ground for, for lawyers. Um, it is a place where um, if you come in and you're representing a child who doesn't speak English, who has no idea where they are on the planet, um, they're going to have to go through a family court proceeding. They're going to have to be before an administrative agency. They're in immigration court. They're being deported. Um, they don't know where their parents are. They've got uh, trauma and crisis going on. Um, and the law is complicated. It's not easy law. It's, it's you know, all of these arenas have really complicated uh, procedures and, and substantive law to, to navigate their way through. Um, and this is a place where if you can do that, you can do anything as a lawyer. And, and so it's a great place to work and think and understand that you make a difference um, we promise students who come into the clinic um, every year, we say it at the beginning of the year, um, before this semester is over, you will change somebody's life. Um, it, universally true. I have never had a student come back and say, eh, not so much, right? Um, always the case. And, and to learn that difference you can make as a lawyer and how important your work can be is, is really um, part of what draws us to this work. So um, I'll turn it over to Dean Green. We've, we've run over as usual. Well, uh, thank you both for that fascinating talk. I would imagine that uh, those in the audience uh, who are lawyers probably want to come back and get involved, <laughs> take your class, get involved in the clinic. It's so exciting. We have some great questions that were submitted in advance. Let's go to the first one. What do you think is the future of temporary protected status? You, Veronica, or me? Uh, uh, sure. I mean, you'll interrupt me, I guess. But um, we don't know. Without legislation, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, temporary protected status uh, is a status uh, that is given to people who are fleeing uh, their country because of natural disasters. For example, uh, we gave uh, TPS, so we call it TPS, uh, to Hondurans because of Hurricane Mitch back in the 90s, right? And those people continue to be here. So they have a work permit, they have a family, they have US citizen children who are now adults who are trying to petition uh, for them to get a green card, to get lawful permanent residence. And uh, there were some circuits, uh, the sixth one included, where people could uh, apply to um, get a green card because the TPS, uh, the courts ruled that the TPS was an admission uh, for them to be able to go on to the next step of applying for a green card. And uh, the Supreme Court just said, no, that's not an admission. And so there are thousands and thousands of people who are pending and uh, worried because TPS is usually given for 18 months and then the months before it expires, it gets extended for another 18 months and it's been like that for years and years. So without legislation, uh, there isn't really much that can be, do, uh, can be done. And, and that is uh, what is so frustrating, right? Because people, as David said, they wanted workers, they got people. So people formed their families. They have US citizen uh, children here. They contribute to the economy and yet their status continue to be called temporary even though they had been here for years and years. You know, which begs the, the question in, in a reform sense of, you know, at what point do we say, let's take the T out of that, right? Let's give someone protected status. Let's say you've earned your, your right to stay here after contributing to our country for 20 years. And so um, how do you move through that? But um, you know, with the Supreme Court last week, we, we moved a step backwards on that front. 
All right, a next question. Do you believe that F1 STEM op will remain as it is for the foreseeable future or do you anticipate changes? I do. Um, F1 is a student visa. Um, students are, are in F1 and um, STEM, uh, it, you know, is, is our, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, our, our sciences, degrees. And, and um, we have a, a program which allows um, students who come to the U.S. Um, after they finish their degree or in some cases while they're working on their degree to work and get some practical training, optional practical training, OPT. Um, as this is happening. And, um, and we've extended that. It's usually a year that, that you can do this work and we've extended it for um, the STEM fields, partly because we need these workers, right? We need people in, in these fields. Um, many of the projects that you would do, someone finishes a PhD, they're doing research in, in a, a STEM field. It doesn't happen in a year, it takes longer, it takes more time. Um, and we have through regulation extended that. I think that, um, the current administration, at least, uh, you know, pending legislative changes that might um, uh, extend that further, is, is likely to not be in a hurry to rush people out. Um, already, we're more welcoming of, of students coming in. We're seeing some upticks, uh, obviously, with the pandemic. Um, international student populations have been drastically reduced, and we had some touch and go moments with um, whether or not we'd allow people to keep their status here, if a class was remote, you know, well, why can't you go home and do it from your home country as opposed to being here and being online from here? And how does that work? And um, we're, we're moving to a slightly better place in that, but we've lost students um, to the world, right? Part of our retrenchment of, of this was to have students around the world look and say, you know what, I could go study in Europe. Um, increasingly, I can go study in China. They have some great universities in China. Right? And I can do this and we've lost market share to this. So our great universities that draw in students are gonna to have to compete harder in the future to keep them. Great, thank you. COVID-19 has caused a backlog in many court proceedings. Has the COVID pandemic slowed case processing in immigration courts? Are your clinic clients experiencing delays? Yes. Yes, unfortunately, right? I mean, it didn't stop us. Uh, the, the pandemic did not stop us. Uh, we were actually litigating cases. And <laughs> while the government was um, ordered to appear telephonically, our clients were ordered to appear in person and we weren't going to let them go by themselves. And so we were double masked and uh, driving in separate cars and uh, driving under storms. And, uh, and trying to litigate those cases, you know, uh, the practice changed so much. Most of the students hadn't met the clients until we met them uh, in immigration court for the first time in person, right? Like definitely they, they were doing Zoom uh, work before. But, you know, we were uh, signing papers in the parking lot of the 7-Eleven because we couldn't right when when the university closed and we continue to do to do this work and and yeah there are a lot of delays uh delays on in decisions i uh, have a couple of cases that are pending uh decisions from the judge there's one that's been pending since early january we also have uh, people who are pending their work permit uh, for more than six months before the law allowed for uh, people to get their work permit after uh, within 90 days of filing and now that is out the window and so we have a lot of clients who are waiting and who are desperate because they are not able to reunite with their families. You know and one thing that's happening in, in the courts and at USCIS is they're uh, often adopting a um, last in first out approach to say let's not let a new backlog develop um, so the, the cases that are filed now, let's rush them and decide them, which means the cases that have been pending and sitting for a long time are just on a back burner. We're never going to get to them at this rate. You know, we have, Kay, Veronica, what's your oldest case at the asylum office? It must be three or four years. Uh, 2016. Yeah. 2016, right? and we haven't even uh, gotten an interview. And, and these clients are not, the government at least is not trying to deport them, but we have not been able to get an interview for them. Right. And, and, you know, and that 
for, you know, if you have a very weak case, perhaps you like that. Oh, they're not getting around to my case. But, but for people who need to go to court to get relief, they can't get a grant until they have their trial, until they have a hearing. And that means they're in limbo and they're just being held. And, and so this is, a, this is a problem. Next question. Immigration lawyers have long called for structural changes in the immigration court system. One proposed change is the removal of the immigration court from the Department of Justice. Do you think that there would be political support for an independent immigration court? Please, um, I, I don't know, right? I, I quit holding my breath for legislative reform a long time ago. Right. So I don't know that there's there's support, but there is, again, an agreement that our immigration courts are broken and they're not good um, in the setup. They're, they're set up to fail. And this, you know, there, there are some very well-meaning judges. There are some very well-meaning um, Board of Immigration Appeal um, members. But the, the caseloads, there's over a million pending cases for 500 judges. Um, and they know that at any minute, they make a decision if the attorney general doesn't like that, if the current political appointee doesn't like it, um, Jeff Sessions got to say out the window, 20 years of, of you know, progressively evolving case law from a court system that, that is quite conservative. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, the immigration judge court is drawn from former ICE trial attorneys. Um, so, you know, this is not a group that's, that's out there producing a, a really pro-immigrant body of law, and yet that wasn't far enough and they just got thrown out. So can we get independent? You know, um, I see in the chat, someone says, you know, maybe Article 3, we're never gonna get Article 3, right? Um, you know, our, our, our independent federal judiciary, that's never gonna happen, but Article 1 is, is the goal. It's the target to say, you know, like bankruptcy judges, um, folks that have some independence, that their decision, certainly their decisions are subject to our court system, right? Our cases from the, you know, even from the, you know, attorney general go up on appeal to the circuit courts and, and they go through our, our system ultimately. So there is that check and balance, but but having some independence would be um, great. Uh, you know, frankly, it'd be nice to scrap our immigration courts and start over. Um, the Right now, the because they're attorneys at DOJ, um, the, the immigration judges have their own union. Um, which the Trump administration decertified um, as a union. So there's a fight about whether or not they can, you know, but you know, that's just a strange thing to think of a bunch of judges in a union um, and, and what that looks like against their employer, the, the, you know, the attorney general um, in this case, and how does it work? And um, so the, the current setup doesn't work, right? You know, having employees of a political branch of, of the, um, the government and agency, the government doesn't work. So. Next question. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, has played a highly visible role in recent public, uh, in recent presidential elections uh, and uh, beyond in societal discussion. What's up next for DACA and the Dreamers? Oh, God, I wish I knew. I have uh, the clinic has a couple of clients uh, who continue to wait. I right? didn't, you know, this population was um, very sympathetic, right? The idea that you were brought as a child to no fault of your own and you made your life here and many times you didn't find out you didn't have lawful immigration status until it was time to go get a driver's license as a teenager. So it's devastating, right? There are many, many cases that are so compelling, but we have been trying to pass legislation since 2000. And now it's 2021 and we're still waiting. And so, um, you know, one of the concerns that, that we have is that there is still a, um, a, a decision uh, pending from a judge in Texas who could completely wipe out uh, DACA. And so uh, without legislation, again, right, like without legislation, we are not going to be able to move forward. Uh, we were uh, filing a case on uh, Christmas Eve thinking, right, like we need to have it in before this decision from Texas comes. And, you know, six months later, we're still waiting for the decision. But, you know, again, right, like our clients are desperate. Uh, they are, at least they are getting work permits. 
but without legislation, it, it's again another band-aid, right? It's, it's again another uh, temporary status that we are just giving to very few people. You know, and, and one thing DACA points out, like, like other areas of immigration law, immigration law is a form of administrative law. Um, it's its own special form. It's got its own rules. Um, in certain instances, we're covered by the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, and other areas we're not. Um, as we practice this and we wor work it through. Um, one of the things that became apparent in the last administration is administrative law principles came to the forefront in immigration litigation in a way that they haven't in the past, um, that, that pushed things forward and um, pushed back at some of the, this free reign and play of the executive to say, well, even on the purely executive side, you've got some procedures you can follow rather than governing by memo and we, govern immigration law by memo, right? We get memorandum of, you know, Secretary of Homeland Security or someone, you know, quite a ways further down and that becomes law um, as, for us as to what's happening. Um, at least you could promulgate regs um, and, and get regulations and go through a process and this gets locked in. Um, we see in the Biden administration already that that lesson was learned. Um, that, that some of the challenges to some of the um, more extreme Trump actions were because they didn't follow normal administrative proceedings. They didn't go through notice and comment. They didn't put out regulations. They just did things. Um, and we're gonna see more regulations. I think we, we aren't gonna get the legislation that, that people want in many cases, but we'll see a much more formal um, process of, of notice and comment and regulation that will we'll put things on a little bit more firm footing as we go forward. And, and DACA's one of those things. DACA is a memo, right? At the end of the day, for all the hundreds of thousands of people who get it, it is a memo from, uh, you know, Mr. Morton, who was, I, I forget, Veronica, acting secretary of USCIS. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's just sort of a, a striking thing that this truly consequential idea was just an internal agency memo. Um, and, and, you know, put in this motion, um, this, this grand wave of things that has really changed people's lives um, to get there. So I think we'll at the very least see, if we don't get legislation, we will see regulation at least to, to make it a little bit firmer in, in the ground that it sits on. We have just a few more minutes. I wonder if uh, the both of you might want to speak briefly on what you think the most important uh, immigration issues are, the most important immigration issues, say, in the next five years. And perhaps DACA is one. Are there others? Well, I am glad that um, that we are going to be able to uh, do cases for victims of domestic violence. You know, I had been a fierce advocate of, of victims of domestic violence, and I'm glad to see that they will get a chance to, uh, to litigate their cases in immigration court. Um, you know, we really don't need comprehensive immigration reform. Right, like if we just made tiny little changes, that could definitely make a big uh, change in people's uh, lives. You know, we have our little wish list, right? Like when David and I uh, talk about it, right? Like, what would you want, right? Like, okay, children should uh, not have to be representing themselves in immigration court by themselves, right? Like we, we need to be able to provide attorneys for people who are not able to, uh, to, uh, to afford one. And uh, because the, the issues that happen in immigration uh, law are uh, very consequential, right? And we have so many, as, as David said, moderate, I mean, litigating or uh, ruling by memo is not a way to, uh, to have our immigration system uh, work. I know David has a couple of, uh, of ideas for, uh, for the future as, as he is uh, teaching uh, immigration law. You know, so Veronica's right that, that you know, little changes could, could work um, and, and do, do major things. Um, we have sneaky things in immigration law. Um, for those of you who know, for example, we have a, a three and a 10 year bar. Um, so if someone's unlawfully in the United States, 
and they leave after more than 180 days here unlawfully, they're barred from coming back in for three years. Um, if they're here more than a year and they leave, they're barred from coming back in for 10 years. There are literally millions of people in the United States who are absolutely 100% eligible for a visa. They're married to US citizens. They have US citizen children. They've worked here. They have clean criminal records. There is no reason that they could not come in. They would have an employer who would sponsor him them. But we've set up the law in such a way that would require them to leave the country in order to process that visa. And the minute they leave, they're barred from coming back in for 10 years. Surprise, they don't go, right? And they stay undocumented. And, and those folks aren't able to tap their potential. They aren't able to, to work through simple changes, simple waivers that, that go into the law that would be more, more easily worked through. Um, we, we just regular, we don't need a new system to run something like that. They, they would go through the regular immigration system. They would just pass in. They just need one tiny little thing removed from their record or the consequences of that. And we used to have that in the law. You know, we used to say pay a fine and you're fine. And we let that piece sunset and it's gone. So there are ways we could, you know, the, the, the nerds of us could can say, you know, we don't necessarily need a big, new, huge program. Um, to go out there. We could just find little niche points where, where pressure points go and work. Um, you know, the other thing I would, uh, you know, echo Veronica on is, is representation. Um, immigration proceedings are considered civil. Now, you might be locked up for years. I had a client once locked up in immigration detention for seven years, yeah. um, but it was a civil proceeding, right? Um, he now lives in Los Angeles and fixes air conditioners, yet um, technically, legally, he is not in the United States. He is paroled in um, to here. So as a legal matter, he's still outside the United States, even though that, that was 20 years ago um, to work here. So we just have these strange, complicated things that say, you know, how do we expect someone without a lawyer to get through this process? Um, adult, child. I mean, it's ridiculous with, with children. Um, I had the opportunity to be um, an expert for a, a case, a class action case in California that was filed a few years back seeking appointment of counsel for children that, that lost on procedural grounds um, rather than substance. But um, I got to testify about why kids need lawyers in immigration proceedings. Um, could not be an easier request ever to talk about why does a child, a four-year-old, need a lawyer to go through this complicated system? Um, my counterpart um, for the government, who was an assistant chief immigration judge, um, who testified that four-year-olds could, could understand what's going on in immigration court, that they could uh, do just fine, that you know if you were careful and slow enough, it took time, but you could bring them through the proceedings. Well, we all just know that's not true. Right? There are lots of fictions in immigration law that we need lawyers and, and cases move more efficiently through the system. Even cases that lose go through faster. The government saves resources when we have lawyers. So finding a way to say this is so important to people's lives, um, we need lawyers. In the meantime, um, all you practicing attorneys out there can take pro bono cases um, to do that. And, and you know that um, you know, my last day of teaching an immigration class, I, I always make a request and a promise, right? Um, and, and it's still good, right? The request is that you take pro bono case, cases, or if you're in a position in a firm, your partner, support your associates who take pro bono cases um, in the immigration realm. You can change somebody's life. Um, that's the request. And the promise is, um, and I include Veronica in this without you know, telling her, is um, when you take that pro bono case and you want mentoring and help, you call us and, and we will back you up. Um, and, and I know from the list that I saw that you know, that's been true of many of you um, that you have and, and you are out there doing amazing things. And so um, we're very proud of you and, and you know, proud that, that you're out there with, with the MSU name. That's really fantastic. I was going to say, don't you need more pro bono lawyers? And I'm glad that you mentioned that. That's a great opportunity. Many uh, young, younger lawyers don't have the opportunity to actually engage in litigation or in-person court proceedings. So it, it seems that there's a lot to do and too few uh, people involved. Well, it's almost eight o'clock and time flies when we are talking to my wonderful colleagues at MSU Law. 
Uh, thank you, Professor David Thronson and Professor Veronica Thronson for speaking with us tonight. You make us proud to be Spartans. And thanks to all of you who joined us. We will resume this lecture series in the fall and you will hear from our exceptional faculty who are preparing the next generation of Spartan lawyers to transform lives and serve Michigan's and the world's diverse communities. In the meantime, do keep on touch, keep in touch, follow us on Twitter at MSU Law, on Instagram at MSU Law College, on Facebook at MSU College of Law, and on LinkedIn at Michigan State University College of Law. Have a great evening.